In the Middle Ages, the Yule season for the Germanic people of Northern Europe was a melancholy affair. With their stock of salted meat, stored grains, and ale, they hunkered down in their stone homes and celebrated the life and the harvest of the year. Sometime in December or January, whenever the snow began to fall, the families of the burgs and villages would unite and break bread together. This was a celebration of life, yes, but also an acknowledgement of death. The feast was treated as a final meeting, as a celebration of the life we share, however brief that may be. At Yule, the members of the family share stories of their lives, tell tales of fortune or misfortune, and relive the times that have come to define them. In the face of death, it's a chance to recall one's life, to leave one's legacy behind. This may be the last chance. The winter, whenever it would come, meant death. The months of cold, the loss of travel and trade, the spread of disease in close quarters, the malnutrition of infants and the elderly. All of this meant the family would likely lose a member by the end of the season. Yule was a way of being courageous, facing death and celebrating life. The gratitude of Yuletide is, for now, the people who know us and love us. They're by our side. It's a time to tell them who we are and what has made us. In an early scene of David Lowery's 2021 film The Green Knight, King Arthur asks his nephew, Gawain, to tell him a story. It's during the Yule Feast, a time of storytelling and remembering of myth-making and legends and Gowan searches his memory for something, anything, worthy of sharing to the king, of expressing who he is and what has made him. Gowan, in all of his youthful inexperience of his drinking and philandering, has nothing worth saying. Through all of the distractions of his youth, he stands for nothing. If Gowan were to die this winter, what would there be of his legacy? Gowan's mother, a powerful witch, summons a mysterious green knight to the round table. Her invitation provides an opportunity for Gowan to have a story to tell. In his selfishness and youth, Gowan has wasted his early life, and Gowan's mother sends this invitation as a wake-up call. When the green knight arrives, he offers to play a game with one knight of the round table. The rules are simple. Face the green knight in a duel. If you land a blow on him, you get to keep his magic axe. In one year, meet the green knight at his green chapel, and he will return with an equal blow. Sir Gowan, feeling shame for having no story to tell King Arthur's court, accepts the green knight's game. However, in his desire to impress his audience, Sir Gawain beheads the Green Knight. Gawain's mother and King Arthur both express their disappointment. In his effort to secure a great legacy, to have an interesting story to tell, Gawain has failed the test. In the test of mercy and kindness, Gawain has shown nothing but arrogance and violence. Gowan's misunderstanding of the game reflects his corrupted understanding of what makes a great man. It's not to dominate and destroy, but to show understanding and care. The Green Knight picks up his own head and reminds Gowan that he must quest to the Green Chapel to complete their game on the following Yule. At the chapel, Gowan must now receive an equal blow from the Green Knight. It's in this moment that Gowan realizes the Green Knight will behead him. If he seeks the Green Chapel, he will seek his own death. In David Lowry's version of this story, Arthur and Guinevere are depicted as sickly and weak. Camelot is a dying and barren land. Gowan is not just younger than the other knights, but he seems to be a full generation removed from the kingdom's wealth and honor. What Gowan seeks the acceptance of King Arthur's court, 
seems to be years out of fashion. Unlike the hero's journeys of old, the quest here seems to be entirely misguided. The wars are over, the knights are old, the king is dying. So what is Gowan really seeking to achieve? One year later, Sir Gowan's duel with the Green Knight has become a thing of legend. A puppet show for the children of the town presents Gowan's beheading of the Green Knight, and Gowan boasts of his own extraordinary courage. It's only when the first snow falls the following winter that Gowan remembers his promise to the Green Knight. His false bravado becomes a shadow over his face. At Gowan's house, Arthur tells Gowan that the quest for the Green Chapel and the fated second duel with the Green Knight is the thing that will make him worthy of knighthood. But Gowan is afraid. He knows his quest. To prove his bravery and secure his knighthood honestly, Gowan must risk dying at the hands of the Green Knight. To become a legend, his life must end. So Gowan sets out on his quest to secure his legacy as a great and brave knight, and in return, Gowan is destined to die. The pallor of death hangs over the whole film. That melancholy yuletide season pervades every frame with yellows and grays and blacks. Sir Gowan's story has been told and retold for a thousand years. The opening of the film reminds us of the many tales of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight by cycling through a dozen fonts representing a dozen versions. The film thereby acknowledges its own place in the great pantheon of this repeating narrative. In Lowry's telling, Gowan's Camelot is a dying and sickly place, subverting the lively glow of versions past. No plants grow there. The king can barely stand upright. The knights have all completed their quest years ago. In this telling, Gowan is too late. When Gowan sets forth on his quest, he passes through the ruins of former battles, empty houses, castles out of use. It's a dying world, and it will soon be lost. Lowry's version of this story highlights what is lost when we fail to appreciate the life we have and the people who know us best in favor of shallow fame. For Gowan, he believes his quest is his attempt to inject his life with purpose and to prove to the king that he's worth the mantle of knighthood. However, Gowan's quest and his failures along the way reflect Lowry's subversion of the hero's journey. In the film's opening image, Gowan sits upon the throne of Camelot, wearing the crown of the king burning in an orange fire. He glows brightly, but that glow is death. Images of circles, from the crown itself to a witch's hex to a hole in the roof, the story will end and a new one will begin and so it will go for all eternity. Our oldest poem about Gowan is a story of honesty and youthful hubris. In the original poem, when Gowan reaches the castle just before the end of his journey, he makes a deal with its lord. Whatever the lord catches in the forest, Gowan may keep, and whatever Gowan is given in the castle must be passed on to the lord. The Lord's beautiful wife attempts to seduce Gowan, kissing him each day. Gowan must pass those kisses to the Lord of the castle in return. For the hunter's wares, Gowan, on his last day, receives a girdle of protection, a magical cloth which will prevent his death. He never gives this cloth to the Lord. It's that cloth, passed down to the other knights, that symbolizes honesty and virtue. In Lowry's telling, Gowan does the same things. He makes the same promise, receives the same girdle, and tells the same lie. The adaptation here accepts the inevitability of it all. The tired performances and the cyclical editing from Lowry play scenes with a tired dread. Characters emote strangely, like it's something they've done a million times, not something they're living through now. It's a story everybody seems to have already heard, or perhaps even already lived. Earlier in the film, Gowan receives the same enchanted girdle from his mother with the same protections bestowed upon it. For viewers, it's unclear if this girdle the Lady of the Castle presents Gowan is of her own creation or in fact the very same girdle which was stolen from Gowan earlier on his journey. 
When watching an adaptation of a famous work of literature, a vocal part of the audience will naturally look toward the changes which have been made to the source material. Lowry's film leans into these moments and relishes in the acknowledgement of each change. Near the end of The Green Knight, the Lady of the Castle speaks of the books in her library, many of which she has written herself. She says she's made changes to some of the stories in the hopes of improving them. A thousand years ago, an unknown author wrote a poem about a young knight, brash and impulsive, who sets out on a quest to prove his worthiness. It's a test of honesty and honor which earns him his knighthood. Lowry's adaptation is less interested in honor and more interested in the crumbling excesses of a dying empire being supplanted by the new life of the natural world. Gowan will always be a knight, and he will always be destined to quest for the Green Knight, but Lowry's story feels like the end of time, perhaps one final journey. In March of 2017, Nintendo released The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. In that game, the player controls a version of Link who returns to a world called Hyrule, which he left behind a century ago. All that's left is ruins, forsaken castles, destitute towns, and empty farms. For those who don't know, The Legend of Zelda is a long-running series of action role-playing games where you play a character named Link, who, with a couple of exceptions, is always destined to save the kingdom of Hyrule. However, as the series has grown, the larger timeline has gotten a bit confusing. It's strange that Nintendo even acknowledges connections between the worlds of these games, but because it has, we are to understand that for Hyrule, there will always be a Link. There will always be a Master Sword, and Link will always be destined to save the Kingdom of Hyrule. While some Zelda games stray from this formula, the majority of the mainline Zelda games have, throughout the decades, begun to acknowledge the cycles of the many lives Link has lived. However, Breath of the Wild is different. If the earlier games were about a hero saving a way of life from the clutches of evil, then this new game is about silencing the last vestiges of evil in a long-dead empire. It's not a resolution for those already alive, but instead more of a promise for those yet to live. Similarly, the 2013 game Bioshock Infinite reckons with the tried-and-true formula of the hero's journey. The hero in this case, Booker DeWitt, finds himself stopping evil in the steampunk-inspired floating city of Columbia, and for a large part of the game, the narrative hits the familiar beats and tropes of any hero's journey, particularly the one demonstrated by the original Bioshock game. In the final act, however, Booker's story loops back in on itself, he discovers an interdimensional portal, and through the portal, he finds the infinite possibilities afforded to him in this life. He sees that, no matter what, he is destined to always find a lighthouse, to always be sent to a steampunk city, to always save the girl, and to always have a prominent hand in the evil being perpetuated in these journeys. Bioshock Infinite and Breath of the Wild are only two examples of this postmodern urge to subvert the hero's journey and center its focus on the cycles of storytelling. Another film released in 2021, The Matrix Resurrections, expresses the hero's journey in the same way as The Green Knight. Neo's story in this fourth Matrix film remixes the elements of the original, playing more like a story told over generations than a sequel to a popular film. In The Matrix Resurrections 2, we find the hero acknowledging his own fate and reckoning with the formula of his own cyclical story. The Matrix Resurrections baffled many lifelong Matrix fans for the same reasons The Green Knight may baffle fans of the original Sir Gawain poem. It's just not supposed to be this way, it's supposed to be different. At the end of the original Matrix, audiences are allowed the catharsis of the hero's journey. Good defeats evil, balance is restored to the world, and the hero is allowed rest in this improved place. Harry Potter defeats Voldemort, Luke defeats the Empire, Frodo destroys the Ring. Even the other hero's journeys, the ones where the hero dies, end on a high note, because the death was not in vain. Films like Gladiator, Braveheart, Spartacus, even Avengers Endgame, tales of great men defeating evil until their last breaths. 
Even the third Matrix film, The Matrix Revolutions, ends with the sacrificial death of the hero, a martyr who is cleansing the world. For them too, the quest was death, but these deaths meant something huge for the worlds of their stories. Sure, they were dying, but it was to save everything. David Lowery's The Green Knight isn't about a great hero. It isn't about a hero at all. Gowan lives a small life, has small dreams, and is destined to live out his days in the dying empire of a forgotten land. Hamelot's portrayal in this film is grim. In a vision of the future late in the film, Gowan isn't knighted in the court before his peers to a cheering audience, but in the king's empty bedchamber. Arthur can barely stand, and the color is gone from his face. Even in this vision, a fantasy vision, the realm of King Arthur has degraded beyond life and health. Yes, Gowan is destined to be king, but the king of what? The days of winning wars are over. In this future vision, Gowan leaves his lover and takes her child with him. That same child years later will die on some anonymous battlefield, losing a war for his out-of-touch father. Eventually, Gowan will die alone somewhere in old age. On his journey, Gowan finds an empty house in the woods and he is visited by a woman named Winifred. She asks Gowan to retrieve her head from the bottom of a nearby spring. And when Gowan asks her if she is really a human being or just a spirit, she asks him this question. Does it matter? That is Gowan's quest, summed up in a question. At the end of all this fighting and ambition and bluster, does it matter? Earlier, when Gowan prepares to fight the Green Knight in King Arthur's court, Arthur tells Gowan the duel is just a game. Before his quest begins, Gowan asks Arthur if the duel is still a game after all this time, and Arthur admits that he doesn't know. It doesn't matter. In The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, is this the same Link who started the hero's cycle in Skyward Sword? Is it the same Link who defeated Ganon in Twilight Princess or Ocarina of Time? And does it matter? At the end of your life, when your quest is over and you're staring into the abyss of what comes next, what will matter? Lowry's vision of the Green Knight is about the ways in which we define our own legacy and whether or not that legacy matters. If we were to tell a story about who we are or what defines us, what would we say? Sure, Gowan is known throughout the land as the one who slayed the Green Knight, but he knows the knight let him do it. As does Arthur and all the people Gowan knows. It's only those who doesn't truly know who believe the legend at all. So does it matter? What's more important, your distorted legacy or your personal truth? When Gowan finally reaches the Green Knight on Christmas morning, the Green Knight asks if Gowan is ready. And three times, Gowan stops the knight from delivering his fatal blow. The first time, Gowan flinches. The knight asks if Gowan spent the year preparing for this moment, and Gowan says he could have spent 100 years preparing and never been ready. The second time, Gowan asks the knight if this is really all there is. The Green Knight responds, what else ought there be? Gowan has a vision of his future, of his life where he to survive this encounter, run away and finish his days as a poor lover, an ineffective king, an absent father, too afraid to remove the enchanted girdle and live with true courage. The third time, Gowan removes his enchanted girdle of protection, kneels again, and tells the Green Knight he's ready for whatever comes. Pointedly, the film ends at this moment as the Green Knight nonchalantly says, Off with your head. In the original poem, the Green Knight lets Sir Gowan live, but in this version, Lowry leaves Gowan's fate ambiguous. Because it doesn't matter if Gowan lives. What matters is Gowan's intention to finish the game. When Gowan is robbed and left for dead earlier in the film, the camera pans in a complete circle twice. On its first trip around, Gowan's body, tied up at the base of a tree, becomes nothing but bones. His fear isn't death, but being forgotten, 
deep in some anonymous place never to be immortalized. By accepting the rules of the game, Gowan becomes a true knight. But does it matter? <laughs>